How exactly do you make sure that the event loop is running as smooth as possible and has no hiccups? Well, it really depends on multiple things that can be quite advanced for a beginner Node.js developer. But worry not, that's exactly what we're gonna be learning in this video. We're gonna learn what you need to do to make it even faster, what exactly you need to avoid, and we're gonna take a look at some refactoring of the code to actually improve the performance. In the previous video, we had an overview of the Node.js event loop, looked at what stages it has, what exactly it's doing in every stage. And in this video, we're gonna be more practical. So buckle up and let's get started. All right, friends. So before we dive deep into this code and understand the possible solutions, let's go over to some theory from the official Node.js website. So we're gonna see that they actually have a blog post called don't block the event loop. So it kind of acknowledges that not blocking the event loop is actually quite a deal. And this article is big. So with this video, I'm trying to summarize everything that you would normally read here. And also shout out to Slava for making this great article that my examples are going to be partly based on. And let's move over to the blackboard. All right. So what happens when our event loop is busy? Okay, we're performing some kind of a CPU intensive task. And every time we get a new HTTP call, or we need to process something else, our application is basically stuck. So we cannot do anything because our event loop is busy computing something. All right. So to avoid this, or actually to demonstrate this first, I'm going to call node. And I'm going to call this first file that I have uh, here. And it's called solution sync. And we're going to see that we're calculating the prime number. So I'm going to explain this in a minute. And we found the prime number and it, it took us this much 1893 milliseconds. Now what is happening within this file? First of all, notice that we are having this set interval, which is supposed to fire every one millisecond, and it's supposed to console log out event loop executed. Basically, it does not happen. Okay, we don't see this in our console. The reason is we are calling this find prime and we're trying to find the two millionth prime number. And this find prime number is actually a function and it has another function inside. So basically what's happening is we're looping until we do find the prime number. And until then, we're going to call this is prime number, which returns a Boolean, either false or true until we find it. And this is quite an expensive function to run, which basically blocks our event loop. Okay, that's why our event loop. So imagine this is a time to breathe for our event loop. So we could breathe here and maybe accept another HTTP call here and process it. But basically, in our first example, we don't have this time to breathe. Okay, this is quite bad. And we need to fix that. Well, what do we do? So we want to try to have some time to breathe here, maybe here, you know, in small chunks, let's say, and what we're going to do is go to our second example called partitioning. Now, before we take a look at partitioning, and basically go over the steps that are required here, I'm just going to give a quick sneak peek saying that we're going to be using promises and this function called set immediate Well, set immediate is explained here. So you're going to call this when you want to execute some piece of code asynchronously, but as soon as possible. All right. In the meantime, I actually want to share something interesting with you guys. I'm working on a side project which is a mix of IoT and AI. But since I'm already busy building all that stuff, I don't have time to build my own API that I need. But luckily, my friends from Zuplo reached out to me offering their solution. Well, Zuplo is an API management tool and it offers me things like API authentication, analytics, rate limiting, as well as a developer documentation that I can have running within minutes. Now, let me show you what I mean. Within Zuplo's dashboard, I already created a project called my to-do list project, and it's a boilerplate for now and that I scaffolded out that I'm going to be building upon. Now, when we go inside, we can expect all the things that we would normally code ourselves. Now we have routes here and I have an example route called get all to do's. And if I call this route like this, I can test it and I get all the data that I need. And the interesting part is actually here. I can create my custom policies as well as some of the policies that Zuplo already has out of the box. For example, I can create 
a rate limiting for my for one of my endpoints. I'm gonna click OK, and I'm also gonna create an API authentication or API key authentication because I don't want anyone to be able to access my project API. Okay, now I'm gonna go to the routes and I'm gonna try to kind of make my get all to do's endpoint more secure. So I'm gonna click on policies. I'm gonna add, first of all, the rate limiter that I defined here. So now we have one and I'm also going to add my API authentication. All right, I'm gonna, yeah, this should be the right order. API key inbound. I'm not gonna save this. I'm gonna wait until it's deployed on edge. And now it is and I can go and test this thing. Okay, first of all, I'm unauthorized. All right, this is what I wanted to expect. Now I can also grab my personal key. For this, I have a developer portal scaffold it out for me. So I'm gonna go to my developer portal here. In this developer portal, you not only have all of your endpoints listed in a nice way, but you can also grab your personal API key. I'm gonna copy it and I'm going to go to the testing page again. And now when I click test, I can give my authorization header like this and I'm gonna post my bearer token like this. And now if we test it, we should get all the data. But now let me do this too many times or too often and I'm gonna be hitting the rate limit here. So too many requests and my API is already pretty good. Later, if I want, I can also add caching like this. And now I also have a caching or a cache for my endpoint. How cool is that? So thank you Ziplo for sponsoring this video. Guys, you can go down in the description and or simply go to zuplo.com to check it out. It's completely free to start and I'm super happy that I discovered this product. Now let's go back to the video. So we talked about our set immediate function. What it's gonna do is set an immediate function inside the promise ensures that the logic runs asynchronously, okay? It's gonna defer the execution to the next iteration of the event loop. All right, so what does it mean in our case? It means that the set immediate is going to let us loop over these all these stages of the event, okay? It falls into the pending callbacks phase first, then into check. So the set immediate is going to be uh, kind of detected here in the pending callback section, and then it's going to be executed in the check section. This is good. Now the question is, since this, this prime is basically the same process that's happening in the synchronous version as well, with the exception of the promise, why exactly do we need a promise here? Well, the promise lets other tasks to proceed concurrently while waiting for the set immediate callback to execute. This prevents the main thread from being blocked. Now, going to our stages here, basically the whole computation that's in, in within the prime function is going to be happening here, Paul. So Paul is responsible for dealing with CPU intensive tasks. So the ones that are running on the main thread, also accepting the connections and so on. But as soon as it kicks in, we're going to call the set immediate. Now set immediate is going to be, uh, is going to move us here into the check and check is going to fire whatever's inside the set immediate, all right? But before that, we have a promise. Now promise also makes it available or lets us rather to compute multiple functions at the same time. Now set promise or not set promise, rather the promise. So set immediate is going to do exactly that. So it, we have time to breathe. So this is when the set immediate is running. Okay, now we are not within the poll anymore. So we are kind of asynchronous. Okay, and promise is going to take this outside of the event loop and put it somewhere here. Okay so that the event loop can also proceed at the same time. And now we end up basically on the other side of this graph. So we're gonna go to the next part and we're gonna go encounter another set immediate and then do some processing within the poll and then move exactly to check again. Okay, this is perfect. This is exactly what we need here. And that's why if I run this file, what's gonna happen is we're gonna see that, well, we found the prime, but while we were trying to find the prime, our event loop managed to get executed six times. So we had six time to breathe while our operation was happening. Now, the question is, do you really want to use this partitioning? And the answer is no. 
unless your computation is quite simple. Maybe you're really trying to find primes for some reason within your application or API server. Then you can do that. You can basically turn it into a promise and use set immediate. This is fine. But usually in the real world, you have much complicated cases and using set immediate kind of makes your code less readable. What you can do instead is this thing. This third solution would be using worker threads. And I already have a video on worker threads solely. If you want to check it out, it's going to be linked in the description. But what we're going to do is we're going to run this thing. Oops, node three solution. Yes. And what we're seeing here is that it actually ran many times and we managed to find the number. Now, what exactly happened here? So whenever we try to run the solution with worker threads, we are basically declaring this find prime. And within this prime prime, we're again returning a promise so that we can subscribe to it or basically do dot then. But within the promise, we are creating a new worker. Okay, and we're passing the number to the worker. Now worker is going to be very simple. It doesn't have the set immediate, but it's basically performing this computationally intensive function that we have previously. And as soon as it's done, it's going to post the, the, the result back. Okay, as soon as the result is is posted back here, we're going to resolve this promise. Now, if we go back out to our graph, what's going to happen here is that the this busy chunk is going to be divided here. So it's going to happen here, then we have some time to breathe. Okay, let me remove this, we have some time to breathe. And then another worker is taking care of this. Okay, taking care of this. And then we have again, time to breathe. And then it's happening here. Okay, we managed to isolate these iterations into separate threads. This is great. Okay. And maybe let's talk about the last solution as well, which is clustering. Okay, you know what clustering is, I already have a video on this. So go check it out if you want. But let me run the file and see what's going to happen. Okay, this is a bit weird, because we did have some time to breathe, but it spinned up multiple workers with the same result. Okay, we basically did the same computation multiple times. Now let's take a look at the code and explain what exactly happened here. So in this code, we're getting the number of CPUs we have. And we're checking if we are the main cluster, the main CPU, so to say, if we are, then we're going to run this cluster.fork, which actually starts a new cluster item. If not, we're going to assume that that we are within one of the clusters and going to do this find prime. Okay, so in this case, this is not really something that you would do. Okay, this is a CPU intensive task. And it's just basically a script. Okay, it's not a web server. So there is no need for load balancing, so to say, because the main function of clustering is load balancing. Okay, so in this comment, actually, we do have an event or an HTTP server, we do create an HTTP server. And here we're listening to the same port. And here you, you can actually spin up multiple clusters and have load balancing. But in our example, it is not needed. So in case you do perform CPU intensive computation, you can spin up multiple servers. Okay, this is going to be a solution. But I'm just trying to say that this output that we have in the console doesn't reflect the actual solution. But clustering is still considered the best way in case you're if you're running a server to kind of overcome this. Now we talked about the solutions. And let's also talk about the reasons why or things that you can do to not even run into this problem where you have to optimize your event loop. Okay, so all these solutions that we saw are fine. But if you can prevent the problem from happening, then you don't even have to find a solution for that. And how do you do that? Well, first of all, kind of avoid synchronous operations, okay, that are long, for example, synchronous streams, synchronous file reading, well, there's an async version of both of these guys. So go for the async version, of course. But if you do something synchronous, make sure that it's snappy. Otherwise, your event loop is going to be blocked. Another thing is timers usage, this can lead to not only a memory leak, but time is getting created, but not being destroyed also clutters your event loop. Also open sockets, or too many database connection pools. All right, then DNS queries, especially crypto functions, the crypto module of Node.js is also very synchronous and can be very slow with a large data, then compressing functions, and also large synchronous operations such as json.parse and lengthy regex operations. 
Okay, so one thing related to clustering is that you need to make sure that you don't run into a fork bomb where a hacker basically uses this denial of service attack to make you spin up multiple forks. Okay, that's why you make sure that you spin as many forks as your CPU numbers. But also if we look at this blog post from Node.js, we're gonna see that we have this Redos. Redos stands for a regular expression denial of service attack. So that's why you need to be careful with regular expressions. We have also have a JSON DOS, which is basically the same, but where the attacker gives you very big JSON shrink and to deny to have your services down. All right, guys, if you like this video or if you didn't manage to understand anything, let me know down in the comments below. And I'm going to try to answer it as quick as possible. Subscribe and follow for more videos. I'll see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.